Well, I come back and good morning to Foston and to the OpenSUSE developer room. Um, I'm glad you're here. It's kind of an early bird session, so we have some, some uh, nice things for you. If you fill out one of those vouchers, we will send you a SUSE Linux 10.1 box when they are out. And secondly, for everybody, we have t-shirts there and those cartons, okay. so just take one. Um, Henne, who is a packager at SUSE Linux, uh, will, will give you, um, um, I think, a detailed uh, presentation about uh, packages and SUSE Linux. And uh, after this uh, presentation, Michael will, will give you an even more detailed insight <laughs> about the uh, about cross building cross distributions with the open build service. Enjoy your day and have fun with your presentation. So as Michael already said, my name is Hendrik Fuglsang. I work in the development department of Nobel as a packager. Thank you all for coming down here this early. I really appreciate it. I expected to have like three people here. And now we are at least 20. Good. My history at SUSE is quite long. I joined SUSE in early 2000. I started in the installation support, helping SUSE Linux customers. Then, somewhere around 2003, I took over everything development related in the installation support. It means I was responsible for bug reporting and for the beta test of the installation support team and stuff like that. And since a little over a year, I'm in the development department now as a packager. So, today I would like to tell you about packaging. Let me first start, start with the purpose of this talk. In the end, I would like you all to understand what is a distribution exactly, how do we do them, and why packaging is a core part of making a distribution. This talk is, will not be another RPM manual. I can't make you a packager in one hour in a talk, so I will not show you spec files and discuss some macros or whatever. I will give you a high level overview first of what packaging is and then in the end I will tell you what you need to know to become a packager. So let's start at the beginning. Everything starts with sources. So the usual output of an open source project is something like this. You've got the project source code, you've got the build tools for the source code, like configure or make files and stuff like that, and sometimes you even have documentation. The usual workflow to get such a project running is that you prepare the source code for the build, that usually involves something like running a configure script or sometimes even you have to edit files manually, then you have to check for the dependencies of the project, do you have all the libraries that it needs, do you have all the other projects that it needs. Once you finish that, you will build the executables with the tools and after that, if that succeeded, you install the executables and the documentation. So now you could ask, why is that not enough? Why do we need packages? And that's the simple reason for that. A usual Linux system, desktop system, consists of 150,000 files. For instance, alone the root directory on a 10.1 has 18 subdirectories, and they all have another 18 subdirectories and you get files and files and files. So you get the idea that we are dealing with a large number of files. The usual software project installs somewhere around 150 to 200 files. So especially with installing or deinstalling software, you're shoveling around files in a large number. 
And it's not only that, this normal way of getting open source software to run involves no checks on previous existing files <coughs> or the deinstallation sometimes doesn't delete files that are there. You need to make sure that uh, software project A doesn't overwrite files from software project B. Sometimes you even have to do stuff manually like creating another user or creating some settings in some files from another software project. So we need to manage all these files somehow. <coughs> and how do we need to, how do we manage files? Simple, you just put them in a box. That's nothing else than you would do when you're moving or whatever. So to know what inboxes in these boxes are without unpacking them, you usually put a label on them. So this would exactly scale for one to ten boxes, then you lose track of what's in there and where they are and stuff like that. So you better start doing something like this. You better start writing a package manifest. So in my package books and magazines, there are this and there's this and this and this and this. In my in the other package books and magazines too, there's this and this and this and this. And that is exactly what RPM does. It has files in some archive. It has metadata that is the label and the description and everything. And the RPM package manager keeps tracks of all the installed packages, and that would be the manifest. So we have source code <coughs> we need to build. Then we need to package them somehow to keep the files manageable. So what else <coughs> do we need for a distribution? The usual look on a distribution is something like that. You say D distribution. But that would be like you say a house is like something like this. But we all know that a house is not only roof, but you need walls and you need a foundation and you need soil property, a nice piece of land to build it on. So a distribution is not this, a distribution is more like this. You have you start with open source software packages or software tables, then you package them, then you define patterns. Patterns are nothing else than saying, I want to serve web pages to a HTTP server, and a pattern would be all packages that you need for that. And then in the end, you put all patterns together and you call it distribution. Some words about the where the source code comes from. This chart shows the distribution of source code in our current build system. You have this large green chunk that is software that comes from the open source community. Then you have this smaller red chunk that is software that we develop in house, like the Yast installation tool. And then you have this little blue chunk which is third party software that we put on a distribution that is not developed by the open source community, not by us, but by some partner of Nobel. So if you look at this cake, you could immediately ask, what does Nobel do? Just, uh, the third party, that's offering and stuff like that. Yeah. So if you look at that, you could ask, what what the heck does Nobel do? And I can tell you this is not the truth. And there are two reasons for that. First, Nobel is nothing that stands aside of the open source community. We are just a big part of it. I mean, we employ like more than 50 lead developers in, project, in projects alone. In this room, I see at least one, two. 
three, there's Brisbane four. I mean, we employ a large chunk of the open source community. That means the red chunk of source code that Mobile touches got a good amount bigger. And the second reason is sad but true, but nobody's perfect. We need to make sure with every software package that it builds correctly, that it integrates with other software packages, and sometimes even that it runs correctly. That means our packages at Novell must assure that these three things are there. That means they have to touch sometimes the source code that comes from the open source community. So numbers to back that old Rachel's claim up. At the moment we have in our build base somewhere around 7,200 software projects. And on top of that we have like 3,100 patches. That makes an average of 2.3 patches per software project. My script to figure out how big the patches are didn't succeed. So yeah. I guess what? Uh, I can do math, but it's the other way around, right? Right. <laughs> you said two to three patches for every software project, but uh, the numbers don't match. <coughs> yeah, but if every software project has two to three patches, then it must be. No, two to three, it's not two to three patches, it's two point three. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the output. Uh, yeah. If you have 7,200 uh, software projects, and let's make it two patches, then you would be having 14,000 patches. Yeah. The numbers don't match. Yeah, could be. <laughs> okay, you proved me wrong. Thanks, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll, but, I mean, you get the idea, we have, for each software project, we have at least one patch. So, the reality is something more like this. Novell touches a big, big chunk of the source code that is in our distribution. So, that's just some words of what Novell really does. So, this is how we do distribution, we too take open source software, we package them, we define use patterns, and in the end we call it a distribution. Some words about our development model. We have this software stream, code stream, that is called factory. So each time a packager updates this package or makes a bug fix or a security fix or whatever, it goes straight into factory. Then from time to time, we kind of freeze that and allow only to get patches and security updates in that factory. We don't allow version updates anymore or big feature patches or stuff like that. That's usually when we start with the distribution. Then after some time, if we get lucky, we get a we make installable media out of that factory stream. That first they are called previews, then you get dealers and RCs, and in the end you get a gold master. Once you have a gold master, you copy the state of the factory stream to another location and just call it SUSE Linux 10.1 or SUSE Linux 10.2. So this is how we do distributions. Then you have two code, code streams, one that is factory that goes on forever, and the other one is the SUSE Linux version that goes on for two years and receives only security updates or major bug fixes. So now we know what we're dealing with in general, source code, packages, patterns, distribution. <coughs> so I would like to start to get into some details. But like I said before, 
I can't make you a package in one hour, so I won't try. I will show you now what you need to know about topics that touches that you have to touch when you package. First again, sources. You have to be able to work with sources. That includes something like you should usually should know the programming language that your package is written. That is a nice, nice, nice thing that we heard about that. Because if there is something wrong, you know how to fix it. And you can look at the source code and you just make a patch. That's the fastest way to fix something. If you don't know the programming languages of the package you package, then you depend on the maintainers upstream, on the developers that develop this project to get these things fixed. And that can take quite a long time. So you need to know, you should know the programming language that your package is. <coughs> Another thing is source code revision systems like CDS or Subvert. The usual task for a packager is to extract some patch, patch from, a, from a revision system. Or you can even have a project that has no stable release yet and is just developing a revision system. So you have to check it out. Most times you only need the read-only part, the read part of these tools. So checking out packages, uh, checking out files or reading diffs of files. CVS and Subversion are nicely documented. There is a CVS book from O'Reilly. You have lots of reference cards in the internet, and for SVN or Subversion, it's the same. There exists a nice book that explains all the concepts and how you deal with Subversion. Another thing you should know are source code build systems like you make. I would guess that 80% of all software projects use GNU Make. So you need to know how Make files work, how you can call Make, how you can give it some things to process in the Make file and stuff like that. GNU Make is heavily documented in the Make manual on GNU.org. So what else do we need? We need to know not only about build systems, but we need to know about tools that make build systems portable. That's something like Configure or AutoTools. Configure is just a script that checks your current, your current system on stuff that is needed for the package. And the AutoTools are one level above and make configure scripts portable and give configure scripts input make files to process and then after you did all that you end up usually end up with make files that match your system. Let me tell you that's a fairly complex topic. There are lots and lots and lots of layers of indirections in your old tools. It's not easy to understand if you look at it on the source code level. But the packager usually doesn't need to know how the ARM tools function in detail. What you need to know is what is going wrong, when, if something goes wrong, and then you can specifically look that topic up. Configure scripts sometimes are just some hacky bash scripts. There is no standard on how to write configure scripts. The, that means there is no single point of, of documentation about it. More and more projects use the auto tools to generate their config, configure scripts. So you could say that 
if you want, if you look at the other tools, you also get a, get an idea of what configure scripts might look like. The other tools are also documented in the book, and a colleague of us, Stefan Hundhammer, made a nice presentation about all these tools, beginning from make to configure scripts to the other tools, how that all works together. So if you want to have a general overview of how that stuff works, you just go to this SUSE user deer, there's an automatic presentation. So, what else do we need? As I said, we have patches. RPM has the concept of pristine sources. That means you never touch the source power. What you do is you unpack it, make it changes, and then you create a patch file with the diff and patch tools. So it's a very crucial part of packager needs. The different tools are also explained in the manual on the new org page. So, if you're creating patches, for a small software project, you might end up with five, ten. If you package a large software project, it can be that you end up with 20, 30 patches. And sometimes they have to be applied in a sequence or they depend on each other. You patch something, then you patch something on top of that. So if you package a large software project and you end up with a lot of patches that have, that have interdependencies, then you might start looking at some tools that can handle patch management. One of these tools is Quilt. That was written by, also by a developer, based on some kernel hackers' patch scripts. And that Quilt is a tool that can just handle these interdependencies. You can apply patches in a certain sequence, you can unapply them, you can modify them, apply them again, stuff like that. So, if you have a large software project, you should look into Quilt. Okay, that was just source code handling. That's just one part of packaging. What you also need to be able to handle is the RPM package manager. But that's fairly straightforward. RPM consists just of one binary that is there for installation, deinstallation, querying, verifying, blah, 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 all the user stuff. Another binary that is RPM build that takes some control files, they're called spec files, processes them, and does all the source code stuff that we talked about before. So it will un package the source code table, apply patches and stuff like that. You define the metadata in the spec files and stuff like that. The RPM is fairly good documented. A good starting point is rpm.org. There's a book there that's called Maximum RPM. It's a little bit outdated, but for a general overview, it's very nice. Fedora has some RPM guide that seems to be based on that maximum RPM that is updated and very, very detailed and describes the way how to install packages, deinstall packages, but also has a large, large topic on RPM building. Pascal made some nice presentation about RPM building that is a little bit more detail than mine. It is somewhere around 90 slides or something. And there are even some training modules at Guru Labs that will teach you how to handle RPM. So in spec files, you can 
define all kinds of things. We at SUSE have our own macro file that defines stuff like how to install info pages or how to restart a service if you update a package or how to stop a service if you remove a package, stuff like that. These are explained in the SUSE package conventions defined in on forgenovel.com. So, you need to be able to handle source code and you need to be able to handle RPM. <coughs> now let's say you have your first project in source code form, you wrote a spec file and you want to build it. So you would take RPM build and just run RPM build on the spec file. But that would mean that you need to have all the stuff the project you're building depends on in your currently running system. You usually don't want to do that. You want to have a running system where you, where you can work with and that is running very well. So once you start using RPM build just on your system, you end up with a large and huge system with all the development files and everything. And once you do that, you also will end up with a system where you have no control over what is installed or what is not installed and stuff like that. So you might want to look into so-called build tools. Until yesterday, you had the two options in OpenSUSE. That's y 2 preamble and build. y 2 preamble is some shell script built around the YAST package manager, and build is a stripped-down version of the script that we use inside Nova to build packages. Both work fairly similar. They take this open SUSE or SUSE installation source, pass the spec file, look into the spec file what packages are needed to build that package, grab the packages and install them in a separate directory on your installation. Then you use some tool like change root to go to that separate installation and call RPM build in there. So what these tools does do is that they keep your A, they keep your system clean of all the development files, and B, your build is fairly reproducible. That means because the packages that are needed to build the software project are given in the spec file, you always know what ends up in your build system. Because they use installation sources, you also don't have to care about security updates, for instance. If you have a, if you have a library and we have, have made a security update for it, you just build against the newest packages. And that's a good way to keep builds reproducible and your system clean. I explained why to PM build in some detail on this, in the this build tutorial on the wiki and build is documented in some cool solutions feature on novel.com. But these two are obsolete by yesterday. Since we started the build service and Michael will tell you more about it in the after my talk, so I won't go into detail about that now. And then, after you are able to handle source code and after you are able to handle packages, then the hard part starts. That's maintenance. A good packager follows the project that he packages he looks for bug fixes, he looks for security fixes, he looks for new versions, and stuff like that. 
And that's the task where most packages fail. You find lots and lots of RPMs in the internet. The hard part is to find some nicely maintained repository. So you can get for project foo.1.0, you find probably 20 packages. But as soon as 1.1 comes out, you find usually only two or three maintained packages where the update happens. And that is really the hardest part, that's where most packages fail. So if you want to be, become a packager, you should make yourself familiar with source codes, with RPM, and then you should know that you probably will invest a lot of time in keeping packages updated and run. That's what I think you need to be able to do to become a packager. Are there any questions about that? exist on the internet. Sorry? Don't you think it's a waste that there's already like two or three different packages for the same software, the same version, which basically means that two or three people are doing the same work? Sure, there's a waste, but you can't stop people from doing these things. Do you, I, do you I, think they do that? What? Why do you think they do that? I guess because most times it is because they don't know about the other packages or because they st all start at the same time. Could it be possible that the distributions are uh, not sharing like, the same macros or the same systems to solve certain problems? Sure. And that's why people end up... Sure, but that's what we will tackle with the build system. That's why Michael will talk about cross-distribution building. So you, will, you have one source, one spec file, and you get packages for many, many distributions. But I don't think you will ever be able to stop people making packages. You just can try to aggregate them. I yes. hope not. Why? I hope not. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's about quite the worst of the ending. You mentioned the build script that knows what packages to install into the change root environment. Yes. Um, how do I tell build which packages it needs to install? Or does it does, does it do that part automatically in the spec file? You, you specify in the, in the spec file which build tools, uh, which build RPMs you need. Each single package? Yeah. No. <laughs> Michael will tell in the build service talk about how we handle that. There's a macro in spec files that called this, that is called build requires. And I wrote a parser for that for the build script. So it will pass the the macro build requires and install all the packages and the dependency they have into the build system. So I could limit myself on the non-usual components and libraries that might be required and it will automatically determine all the other dependencies. Yes. What the lead dependencies are, because if you say I need X, I need KDE development packages, they already require having X or development packages, they already require sure. QT development. So don't have to say I need QT and X or and KDE development. It's sufficient to say I need KDE development, but you have to tell those words. Also compiler, sure. for example, you have to say I need a C++ compiler. Except for development packages. There's no real way to figure out, like, okay, if I have a development package of uh, package A, does it require development packages of B, C, D? Sure, there is a, a there is an easy way to figure that out. You just pass the lib tool files and you make the build fail as soon as the development package doesn't require the other development packages it needs. 
So you make what? That's a lot of work. That's usually for each package that's a work of two minutes. I mean, you just pass the tool files or, or look at the dependencies, and then you say the, your build failed because your development package doesn't require all the other development package it needs to be functional. So that's for each package. Well, I mean, if I have 100 packages, that's maybe half a day of work. We actually do, do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Over and over, we have a regular system to, uh, to uh, find the dependency of the package of the so called Melvin package. Uh, Sorry? Can you speak up a bit? Over at Mandriva, they figured out a way to figure out the, uh, the relationship between different development packages. Well, that's what we do also. Okay. I'm interested to see how you guys do. Sorry, um, I'm not really sure as to what the question is. Because if, if a development package is required and the package is done properly, then that should in any case bring down its own dependencies. Sure. Development. So, yeah, you only need to do kind of develop, I mean, if you only need to do your own in code tracing if, if it, the original package isn't done properly. Sure. So. But that's a fairly usual problem development packages have had in the past. That they, because they, they don't bring any libraries that have huge dependencies because it's just the library of this, the development part of the library of this de develop package and they don't bring any requires on, automatic requires on others. So you have to specify the menu. You have to say, my GNOME GDK2 devil depends on GDIP2 devil. You have to specify that menu. But we just, I mean, we tag a lot of things with the open SUSE build service because we will make packages fail on stuff like this. So a package will never get a binary RPM if he, of some devil packages if he doesn't care for dependencies on other better packages. Right. Yeah. So just like to comment on this one. Yeah. Um, basically the idea is that's also a large benefit of using uh, Y2 PM build or whatever the new build service is, is that when you start building a, a change route from scratch, um, which is what those tools are doing, if you didn't specify some package and the build requires, it's going to fail because it's not there. So the most important thing is that the build fails. If you have to rewrite the spec file and build again, so what? That's not really the issue. It would be problematic if you're um, working on a, on a your live system and you have package packages installed, for example, devil packages that are not mentioned in the build requires and it just works. The configure script will work because they're there, but you didn't specify them in the build requires. That's an issue. Yeah. If the build breaks, so what? You know there's a problem, so you can fix it. That's not really an issue. So this is also a huge advantage from building in a change route that is installed from scratch. That's what I meant with reproducible. <laughs> because you always have the same packages. If you build the package, or I build the package, or let's build the package, you always have the same package to install. Some configures could also do a lot of automatic probing and simply add a lot of features because they find sure. the libraries are installed. But that's also, some, I mean, that's also something a package has to take care of. I should at least meet once the output of the config script. <laughs> What, no. what about libraries or header files that are not part of the distribution yet? So I would need to do two cycles build. First, the libraries that are required to build the package. How can I integrate them into the build environment? Well, with the open source build service, you just create a project and you put both things in there and you can figure out the way which one depends on which. So you might have to add additional installations. Yeah, because uh, we're going to go into too much heat that the soft packages won't be hosted in the build service. <laughs> because everyone knows what kind of, so you might have to add Pac-Man or my repository or something to installation also. Any more questions?
No? That can be. Good. Then I'm done early. Five o'clock, done early.